So here we go, Isaiah, we're going to overview it. We're going to look at this man's life, who he is. We're going to ask the question, how does Isaiah preach the gospel? As though the question ought to be asked at all. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to start our reading in verse 6. Just a bit before we dive into this, I'm going to get a deacon to come forward with a cup of water because I forgot to uh, supply myself with some water. Someone's running to that job right now. Larry. Larry's just elected himself to the deacon's chair. And he's going, <laughs> hey, this is the house that Larry built. So no, no criticizing Larry tonight. Have a look at your Bible. Isaiah chapter 40, starting at verse 6. This is the prophecy of Isaiah. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and it's, all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Verse 9 goes on. Go on up to the high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the water in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him to understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To who then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare him? An idol? A craftsman casts it and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heaven like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes rulers of the earth as emptiness. Verse 25, we'll finish up with this last couple of lines. Isaiah the prophet, hears the word of the Lord and it is thus, God says, to whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. May God bless the reading of his own precious word. The book of Isaiah is a tremendously profound prophetic book of the Old Testament. Many of the commentators have said that Isaiah really is the prince of prophets. Of course, you've got Jeremiah and Ezekiel and some, some great and mighty prophets that we've already studied in our series here each Sunday night, but none compare with Isaiah insofar as his scope, insofar as the subjects that he treats and his literary designs are absolutely profound. If there was ever a book in the Old Testament which clearly shouts the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's the very book of the prophet of Isaiah. This guy prophesied 66 chapters in our modern English Bibles, that's how it's broken down, across almost 60 years of his own life. And in fact, Isaiah will give his life to the mission that God had called him to, that is to declare the word of the Lord to a wayward nation. Who, who is this prophet? Who, who is Isaiah? Well, we are told in the text of Isaiah that he's actually a prince. He's actually a nephew of the king of Judah, reigning in Jerusalem. The man is raised in the royal courts 
of Judah. There's some traditional ideas that maybe Isaiah went into the priesthood and served in the house of God. But here is this man who has now been called by a prophet to stand and declare to the Israelites God's word. To, to not only declare to them God's word, but to declare it in such a way that you and I even tonight can come to the book of Isaiah and be tremendously challenged and changed by the contents therein. Let's take a look at the calling of Isaiah. If you've got a Bible, I'm going to invite you to flick on over into chapter 6. Just as you're going to Isaiah 6, let me give you some, some facts about the, the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah is quoted directly in the New Testament over 65 times. An entire chunk of the New Testament literature is actually repetition from the book of Isaiah. That's direct quotes. The amount of times Isaiah is alluded to or paraphrased is beyond numbering. It's, it's beyond anyone's ability to actually map it and, 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 and write it down. This man is a tremendously profound guy. He's mentioned by name in the New Testament over 20 times. He's seen the fulfillment of his prophecies in his own lifetime. And when we take a look at Isaiah chapter 6, as I've welcomed you to turn there, I'm going to head there myself just now, we will see exactly what it is that starts the call of this amazing prophet. Here he is, probably a priest, definitely a prince. He knows the royal house in Judah. He understands the politics of the day and the way things are happening. And, and now he has an experience. And so we read it in Isaiah chapter 6. He he narrates it for us, verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Isaiah has his vision. He, he experiences a vision of the very Lord of hosts, the almighty God. It says he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him, above the Lord, stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, the seraphim flew. And one seraphim, one angelic being, it tells us, called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And at this point, Isaiah says in verse 5, And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Here it is, people. Here's the commission of the Old Testament's greatest prophet, so to speak, as he sees this vision of the Almighty Jehovah, the Lord of all, seated on a throne, surrounding the throne. Above it are these seraphim, and they, they fly with two wings, cover their face and their feet with two more pairs of wings, and they shout one to another, Holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of the shout of the angel, the text tells us the entire temple billows with smoke and the thundering of the foundations begin to rock and shake at the profundity of worship from the angels to the sovereign God. Such a magnificent sight is this. Isaiah, who's a pretty clean living guy, he's a prince, he's probably a priest, he's a pretty, as far as human standards go, he's probably a pretty holy guy. When confronted with the vision of the Lord of all, we are told he collapses and he screams, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm lost. I, I have lips that are unclean. I dwell amidst the people who are unclean. And now he says, my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. It goes on to tell us that one of the seraphim, one of these beings, these angelic beings that are flying around the throne of Jehovah, one moves over and takes a burning coal and presses it against the lips of the prophet and gives a ceremonial sanctifying cleansing upon the prophet. He says, behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then it's now that Isaiah in this experience, in this vision, he now hears the voice of the Lord. We turn to see what the Lord says to the prophet Isaiah. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah responds the only way a mere mortal can respond. He says, here am I, send me. And the Lord said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing but do not understand. Keep on seeing but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and make, their blind, make blind their eyes lest they should see and hear and understand. Isaiah asks the Lord, for how long? 
Could you imagine this kind of a commission? Could you imagine having a vision of Jehovah and feeling all warm and fuzzy inside? And then the Lord says, who on earth are we going to send to do our work? And you put your little hand up, Lord, send me, I will go. And the commission is, off you go. Everything you say, you will only darken their heart more. Prophesy, Isaiah. Preach, Isaiah. Declare the word of the Lord, Isaiah. And in doing so, they will grow ever more blind, ever more deaf, ever more rebellious to the word of the Lord. Too late to pull out. You'd want to. You want to cash in your, your, your resignation. You want to sign off your letter of resignation. But at this point, you've now signed on to be the prophet of the Lord. And such is the commission of Isaiah. So Isaiah asks the obvious question, how long, O Lord? How long will these people's minds go dull? How long will their hearts grow dim? How long, Lord, until you revive them? I think at this point, it probably serves to give a little bit of a historical background. At this point, under Isaiah, we have at this point, the northern kingdom of Israel has altogether been swept away and there is almost nothing left. It's turned into a wasteland. And now Isaiah is in Judah and they are petrified, absolutely petrified that the same thing is about to happen to them. And Isaiah asks, Lord, how long? Tell me how long. And the answer comes, verse 11, until cities lie waste without inhabitants. And houses without people, and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people from afar, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Isaiah now learns, at the commencement of his ministry, Isaiah now learns that his entire life is going to be spent prophesying to a people who absolutely hate him. I think my gig's tough, right? I think there's some people here who kind of like me. I've got family here, for goodness sake. Someone here's got to like me doing my job, but could you imagine the calling of Isaiah? It gets so bad for Isaiah. Get, I'm going I'm to lay this on you. I didn't plan on going into this. There's so much in the story of Isaiah. It gets so bad. He's walking around in a hessian sack, right, and man-made sandals. That's his life now. They hate him so much. That's his life now. And he goes around prophesying, preaching, declaring the word of the Lord, and he's absolutely hated and despised and rejected and ridiculed and all those things you can imagine. And then the Lord comes and speaks to Isaiah, and I'm sure Isaiah thought, finally God has come to bring relief. You know what God says to Isaiah? Take off the sack. Take off the shoes. For three years, God said, you will now be naked. I'm not even kidding you. Go read the book. For three years, the prophet is called to go around and preach naked to expose the guilt and the ridicule for people of Israel. Don't ever ever come to me and tell me, well, I think God's calling me to do this, but I don't really want to do it. We know nothing of sacrifice. We know nothing of really serving Jesus as Isaiah has. And as I mentioned earlier, this man for almost six decades served the Lord, faithfully prophesying, and in the end, Finally, they grab him, they take him, and they saw him in half to kill him as a martyr for his message. It's a profound life, and if only tonight of me giving you the overview of the book of Isaiah, we could just study a biography of this profound man of God, but in fact, we, we can't. His commission, his call, his call is to prophesy to a people who hate God and rebel against him and will inevitably kill him, the prophet. And yet he goes. The faithful prophet of God goes and does his duty. He declares to the people that which God has told him to declare. Let's take a look at some highlights in the book of Isaiah while we're, while we're moving forward. Even in Isaiah's own lifetime, he saw the fulfillment of some of the prophecies that he in fact declared. Sennacherib's effort to take Jerusalem failed, as Isaiah said it would, chapter 37. The Lord healed Hezekiah's critical illness, as Isaiah had predicted, chapter 38. This story of Sennacherib is a profound story. You have to remember that Israel is divided into two kingdoms. Remember this, right? There's Israel in the north, and the southern group is called Judah. And Israel is gone, absolutely gone. It's a wasteland. And now the armies of Assyria, with Sennacherib the king and the commander, marches down to Jerusalem, encircles the city, and starts screaming out to the inhabitants, you have 
have no hope. Your God could never save you. And then this Sennacherib character, this king of Assyria, starts listing the nations and the gods that he has entirely destroyed and dragged into exile. And then Sennacherib, when he finds the people aren't being moved, he then says to him, your God has in fact sent me here to destroy you. Your God hates you. I'm going to destroy you. And then Sennacherib says, by this time, in the next couple of days, your families will be consuming their own dung and drinking their own urine. We will entirely cut off all provision of the city. You will all starve to death. The king in Jerusalem this time, his name's Hezekiah, and he freaks out. You, you get a picture this. The Assyrian army is a couple hundred thousand troops couple hundred thousand troops surrounding this little city called Jerusalem. A city that's about eight miles in diameter. 200,000 troops thereabouts. And Hezekiah the king freaks out, calls upon the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah says, this time tomorrow you'll see the deliverance of the Lord Almighty, the God of hosts. Many of you know the story. It's an amazing story. That night when Jerusalem shut down, everyone went to bed. In the middle of the night, the Lord sent an angel of death and killed 185,000 of the Assyrian troops in a matter of hours. Jerusalem wakes up the next day, and every day hence they'd woken up to a mass of army screaming and shouting and declaring that they're going to destroy and kill them. And this morning they wake up, there's nothing but silence and carcasses strewn as far as the eye can see. God continued to deliver at the word of the prophet Isaiah. But do you think that means the people began to hear? Do you think that means the people's hearts began to soften? They began to become humble? They began to repent and, 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 and turn to God? No. Not any more than people in our own day where you work, where you go to school, where, where you, 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 you have your hobbies and your, your, your times of leisure, these non-Christians all around you that, that even though they've got breath in their lungs and they've got food and homes and cars and, and luxuries, even though they won't turn to God. And so Isaiah's prophecy is a profound word even for our own day. Isaiah prophesied that the great king of Assyria will come and have his army destroyed without any citizen of Judah lifting a finger. And so his prophecy comes to pass. Even greater than that, Isaiah prophesies that Judah will be swept away. It's so one of the great things about the prophet of Isaiah is even though the northern kingdom was devastated by Assyria, the southern kingdom was delivered by Assyria. But one of the sins of Judah that Isaiah continued to, to criticize and call people to repent of was that the, the, the political powers, the kings and the princes of Judah continued to want to make allegiances and alliances with other pagan nations. They tried to do it with Assyria. They tried to do it with Egypt. And then after Assyria is destroyed, that great story I just told you about the angel killing them all, after all that, then the king... Hezekiah, in Jerusalem, invites an envoy from Babylon, a tiny little nation just on the horizon of the chronological of mankind. He invites them to come to Jerusalem. He shows them all the great things in the palace and the temple, all the wealth and, and all the good things of the nation of Judah. And Isaiah comes on the scene again. Because you welcome the enemies of God, because you welcomed Babylon, it will not be long and you will all be swept away by the Chaldean army, the Babylonians. In Isaiah's own lifetime, he prophesied of the Babylonian exile. The northern kingdom swept away by Assyria. The southern kingdom is now, a hundred years about after Isaiah said that, swept away into Babylon. That's pretty spectacular. Anyone that can predict the future a century out is a pretty gifted prophet. But it gets better than that. Isaiah prophesies not only that Babylon will come and sweep Judah away, Isaiah prophesies a nation that didn't even exist yet that there will come an empire called the Medes and the Persians. And they will be reigned and ruled by a king who will come and he will be compassionate upon the Israelites. His name will be Cyrus, the king of Persia. He will come on the scene and he will deliver Israel from the Babylonian captivity. See Isaiah 44 and 45. All these prophecies Isaiah gave from the mouth of God into his heart, into his ear, and he declared to the people of Judah. A profound prophet. And that's not even the best of it all. The best of it all is the accuracy the detail, the fine point with which Isaiah continually prophesied the life, the death, 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ the Lord. The greatest of it all. In fact, many have called Isaiah's prophecy the gospel of Isaiah. There is just so much about Jesus Christ who's going to be six centuries after Isaiah, at least the life of Jesus Christ the Messiah. We looked at some of his life. Isaiah saw the Lord. He was blessed with the commission. His life was rough. He was hated, rejected, and yet he persisted in faithfulness. Some of the great sins of the people of Judah, as we've mentioned already, injustice, inability to love God, hatred for the poor, a lack of respect for those who were despondent and downcast and, and treating people with social justice and taking care of the needy in the community. This is what the nation of Judah had entirely abandoned. And again, as we mentioned, continual attempted allegiances with pagan nations and God would judge them for this. It's not all doom and gloom, though. You read Isaiah, and it's kind of a, it's a very peculiar read because you, you might go a whole chapter where it's just really dark. It's just really, really, really ominous and, and really macabre and even pretty depressing. And then at the end of the chapter, there'll be three verses where it just shines in this awesome light of a glimmer of hope. Isaiah, in fact, is full of hope. It's a prophecy of hope. Isaiah 33, verse 5, the Lord is exalted. He who dwells on high will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. Zion being Jerusalem. And he will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom, knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. But as you read, as you read the prophecy of Isaiah, it becomes really clear that Isaiah is not referring to the Jerusalem of his own day. Isaiah will prophesy time and time again the city of David, this great city that David conquered and established as the, the capital of the entire empire of Israel, the city where Solomon will build the great temple of God. Isaiah prophesies the entire destruction of the city. But then he continually makes an allusion to a future city, a future city who, whose reign is God and whose rule is the kingdom of God. Isaiah will, in fact, prophesy not only a century ahead of his time, not only six centuries ahead of his time, there are many of Isaiah's prophecies that are still being fulfilled today and will be fulfilled in the years to come. It becomes clear that the Jerusalem Isaiah is focused on as the inheritance of God is a spiritual city. It's a nation that God is building, and God is building this nation from all the nations of the world. It's in Isaiah that you get these amazing statements like, God will draw the people from the furthest islands and the furthest coasts, and he will draw them into the holy mount of God. It's, it's Isaiah that begins to declare that Jerusalem will be, a, will be a blessing on the lips of all the people of God from every tribe, nation, and tongue. So even though Isaiah traces the history of the physical city of Jerusalem, and we know that that's where Jesus is going to, in fact, be destroyed. He's going to be killed. He's going to be crucified just outside the city. We know that Jerusalem's going to get another chance after they kill the Messiah. One of Jesus' most prominent apostles named Paul will force his way back into the city to preach and declare the grace of God for anyone who simply turns. And the citizens of Jerusalem will arrest Paul. They'll tie him up. They'll try and have him killed and will fail. And we know Jerusalem will be destroyed. About AD 70, the armies of an empire that wasn't even a figment in the imagination in the days of Isaiah called the Roman Empire will march down on Jerusalem and will sack them entirely. So what Jerusalem is Isaiah continually pointing to? A city from above, he says, not a city below. A city in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so when we turn to the New Testament, we find these illusions. We take a look at Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Ezekiel speaks more fully to a future city, a holy city, adorned with justice and freedom. Galatians 4.26, Paul says, But the Jerusalem above, she is free and she is our mother. Or well, we might take a look at Revelation 21 verse 2. This is what John the Beloved says, And I saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And Isaiah gives us the future image. I'm going to read from Isaiah 35 right now. If you've got a Bible, flip there with me. The future of the city of David is the abode of the redeemed of God who come from every tribe, nation, and tongue. All the ethnicities on the globe are called through Isaiah and through the gospel to come and partake freely of the grace of God. Isaiah 35, verse 3 to 10. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool. The thirsty ground springs of water in the haunt of jackals where they lie down. The grass shall become reeds and rushes and a highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they will not go astray. No lion will be there, nor will any ravenous beast come up upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be on their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Friends, this is not a physical city. This is not a city that actually exists anywhere in the world right now, but we know this city is the place of peace that is brought for those who by Jesus Christ are redeemed from their sins. And so Isaiah answers these questions for us. He doesn't just tell us what will be the future of Israel, what will be the future of Jerusalem. He tells us how and who. If you're reading the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah's own day, it would be a tremendously confusing book. And yet as we read it now, Christians, a couple of thousand, maybe 3,000 years onward, we have so much clarity as we begin to see what Isaiah, in fact, teaches us. The who. Well, Isaiah gives us these things. It's from Isaiah that we learn the name of the Messiah is Emmanuel, God with us. The virgin shall bring forth a son and they shall call him Emmanuel. It's Isaiah that tells us that the titles of the Redeemer, the Savior that God sends, will be Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, and Mighty God. In fact, if we take a look at Isaiah 42, if you've got a Bible, I'm going to invite you to turn there. Isaiah 42, we're going to have a read here of what it says. Starting verse 1, Behold my servant. Whom I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights, I've put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth justice to the nations, and he will cry aloud and lift up, or lift up his voice, or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice on the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. We read on and we we turn down if we can to verse 6. I am the Lord, I've called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes of the blind and to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from prison of those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I will give to no other. Constantly in Isaiah, there are the constant allusions to the Messiah is coming. God is sending a king, a king who will come in David's throne and he will rule and reign with peace and justice and righteousness. The New Testament, as I said, over 60 times quotes Isaiah, pointing to Jesus Christ all the time, all along the way. Every part of Jesus' life fulfills these prophecies. That's the who. The who is Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ. But lastly, we finish up here. Isaiah answers the how. It's not just about who. It's not just keep your eyes open for a Messiah, a king. It's also about how. How will this king redeem? And for this, we turn to the most famous passage of all, Isaiah 53. We have to wind this to a close, but we'll take a look here. (coughs) 
Perhaps one of the greatest chapters in all the Old Testament. So now you have a king is coming. Now you have the Messiah is coming. The people are rebellious. The people are wayward. The people have sinned. No one here can't could fail to put up their hand and say, That's, I'm in that bracket, I'm in that category, I've sinned, I've failed, I've broken God's laws, I'm guilty. Isaiah gives more than just something to look for. Isaiah preaches that God will not only provide a king, but he'll provide a way. He'll provide a way for guilty people like you and I, sinners like you and I, imperfect humans like you and I, that God will provide a way that even though we are sinful God is a way to make us eternally clean, righteous, perfect, and holy. So we take a look at Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he's heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And now it begins to describe Jesus almost to the T, for he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him uh, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, upon him people, the king. God's king, not man's king, God's king. Upon him, the text tells us, upon this king is the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we can be healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He's a king. He's righteous. He's God in flesh. He's Jesus Christ. And the good news, friend, for you and I tonight, the good news from Isaiah is that he is a substitute for sinners. The Bible is very clear that when God issues a command, he is not kidding around. He gives a command and he gives a penalty that's appended to the command. All who have sinned will surely die. That's the bad news. The bad news of the Bible is that if you're a sinner, you will absolutely, for sure, for certain, without any doubt, you will die. And who, as I said, who, who here tonight, who among us could say, I've, I've never sinned, I'm perfect. I look at God's standard of, of goodness and holiness and I think I've met the standard. None of us could say that. All of us in our own way, in our own time, in our own life have failed to honor God perfectly as he demands to be honored. So what's God going to do? Is God going to take the world and just squash it between his thumb and forefinger and plan to start again? Is that God's God's idea of love and justice and mercy? The Bible tells us that there is good news. That all who've sinned, all who have failed to keep God's law perfectly, that's me, my hands up, all of us can only find eternal life through one way and one way only. And that is that if there would you... Find a perfect man, never sinned, no sin of his own, and if he would be willing to die in your behalf, then you could actually be saved. You could actually be spared. Your sins would be removed and you would be forgiven. But I challenge you, I challenge you, even if you could, even if you you were able to, to speak to every human being alive on planet Earth today, ask every single one, firstly, have you ever sinned? And if the answer is yes, no good. And if they have never sinned, and they have, if they have never sinned, then ask them, will you be willing to die for me, please? The answer is going to be no. There's no hope. There's no life. There's no forgiveness outside of this suffering servant, Jesus Christ. That God saw the futility of man's ways and he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to be born of a virgin to live the miraculously sin-free life that he lived, and at the end of his life, with no sin of his own, the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ, no sin of his own, he died upon the cross. So that anyone, any sinner, no matter how bad, 
No matter how much you've sinned, no matter how much sin you have, no matter how bad your life has been, doesn't matter what you've done, but it does not matter if you trust in Jesus Christ. If you take a hold of him and give your life to him, Isaiah promises that he stands in your place and dies for you. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. The kingdom has come. All that Isaiah has prophesied regarding Jesus Christ is fulfilled in the perfect Savior. It's here. It's available. It's now. Salvation is now in Jesus Christ. There's not a moment to delay. There's not one more night to go to bed and leave this all up in the air, undecided. There's no more time to spare. The gospel, the good news of Isaiah is declared to you and I. If we trust in Christ, all our sin is flushed away. And we now have received eternal life forever. The great news of Isaiah, I'd love to keep reading this entire passage. I'd love to go through all of Isaiah with you tonight, but there's just so much in this profound book. Isaiah answers these questions. How do we stand before God in our natural state? It's clear we're sinners. And God is a just God, holy God, righteous God, and God will destroy sinners. So what will God do? What's God's plan? God's plan is to glorify himself, not idols, not false gods, not false religions or false philosophies. God will glorify himself through the salvation of all who willingly come to him and only through Jesus Christ. And so he's glorious. Paul tells us in Romans that in this way, God will be both just and the justifier of all who trust in Jesus. God doesn't lower his standard of holiness. God's not letting people into heaven through some trap door or some back door or some secret way. Not lowering his holiness, but rather he's elevating it to a divine standard and then sending Jesus Christ to fulfill the standard and die for all who simply trust in him. I know many of us tonight, even here, have have trusted in Jesus. We've come to the realization that we cannot do this on our own. We can't please God. Religion is futile toward God. But God sends his son to die for us. And for those here tonight who have yet to trust in Jesus Christ, here's the good news of Isaiah for you and I. Maybe you came tonight, you never heard of Isaiah, but what is all this talk of Isaiah? He's a prophet of God who came bringing the greatest news anyone could ever hear. That although our sins are crimson, they're red, they're blood-stained, God, through His grace and mercy, will wash us white as snow. And the answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is Jesus Christ. The author and the finisher of our faith. Wouldn't we pray tonight? Ask God to bless our time around the Word, around the the Gospel of Isaiah, the, the Prince of all the Prophets. Ask God to bless this book to our life and why don't we make the commitment one to another as we go to God in prayer that we would, we would renew our energy for the book of Isaiah. We would, we would turn to it more often. We would read it, study it, apply it to our life. It, it's the greatest of all the prophecies yet so often neglected by Christians. Why don't we just commit that one to another as we go to God in prayer. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you again. We thank you, Father, that you're here in your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit, right here in the midst. And many of us have come tonight, Lord God, we've come to celebrate how great you've been to us in providing for us this this church as it grows and and it seeks seeks to have real, real impact in our community and the nations of the world. And we understand, Father, the only way we're ever gonna truly do good is by the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that we we can acknowledge that we're sinners. We can understand our guilt, our shame, our fallenness. And then we can glory in the salvation of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, tonight that as we've taken this very, very, very superficial study of Isaiah and we've been so blessed and moved and challenged by the life of this prophet and what you've been doing through his life, even today, calling us to repentance calling us to faith, calling us to lay down our life for you. No matter what that means for us, Father, even if it means that we, we go and be the most, the, most, the most outcast prophet ever, we would do it for you. May we answer like Isaiah answered. When you say who will go for us, may we put up our hands and say we will go. Send us, Lord, we will go. 
And our prayer tonight also, Father, along with that, is that for those here tonight who are yet to give their life to Jesus Christ, for those here tonight who have yet to trust in Jesus Christ, that even as we've been speaking, the Spirit has been moving upon their heart and bringing real change, bringing faith and trust in the good news of salvation in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Savior, Jesus. I pray for that tonight, and I know, Father, by your grace, you're moving among us, and you're changing us, giving us, Lord, the grace to bear fruit in our life through what we've heard. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.